let's take a look at some of those the structures, relevant structures. So we're going to start with the female reproductive organs. Eggs are produced in the ovaries. In this picture, the ovaries are right here. I'll bring my, the laser pointer over it. Um, this is an ovary. This was the site where meiosis will lead to production of an egg cell. That egg cell, uh, once it's released from the ovary, it will travel down the fallopian tube. That's this tube right here. And that tube leads to the uterus. The uterus is the site where a baby would develop if fertilization takes place. Um, that uterus um, leads to the outside of the body through the vagina. So that's the organ that allows copulation. This allows um, sperm to be delivered into the body. But this is also the birth canal. This is the birth canal that a baby would have to pass through in order to come out to the outside of the body. Male reproductive organs. Um, there are quite a few detailed structures here that we could go into a lot of detail on, but what I'd like for you to, to take away from this is the um, more of the, the overall major concepts, which probably this is review for you from high school perhaps. Um, sperm is produced right here in the testes. The testes are housed inside of a scrotum. The scrotum is the sac. And there's a reason why this is on the outside of the body instead of embedded inside. This has to be on the outside of the body in order for the temperature to be maintained a little bit lower than what um, homeostasis sort of keeps the body temperature at internally. So sperm, um, sperm, in order for sperm to be developed and healthy, it needs to be happening at a slightly lower temperature than body temperature. So that's why it's on the outside of the body. Once the sperm is produced, it makes its way into the epididymis, which is this right here. The epididymis is the site where sperm sort of finish maturing. They're not active yet. They're not in an active form. Um, the epididymis just kind of houses them until they're needed, until ejaculation is going to take place. So from there, the sperm would travel up the vas deferens. That's this tube. This is the tube that is cut if a person has a vasectomy. Um, that means that this tube gets get snipped and then that way there's no way for the sperm to make it out of the body um, in most cases. So that's the vas deferens. That leads to, if we follow the pathway, um, up in this area there are a few key glands right here. This is a seminal vesicle. Right here is the prostate gland and right here is the bulbal urethral gland. Those three glands work together in order to make uh, the sort of the fluid that accompanies the sperm all put together that's called semen so those glands secrete uh, secrete their fluids the seminal vesicles they're producing a fluid that's high in energy this provides some some sugar energy for the sperm um, the prostate gland this produces some things that uh, again it just it contributes to semen the fluid that the sperm travels in and uh, it has a number of number of functions. We're not going to go into that much detail. Anyway, once the semen is produced, it leaves the body through the urethra, uh, through the penis. Um, so what we're going to do is jump over to fertilization. If fertilization is going to take place, you know, it starts with, with, well, ejaculation has to happen first, so the sperm get released into the female body, into the vagina. Usually there are about 300 million that get released. So that's a lot of sperm. Not very many of them survive all the way to the point where they could fertilize an egg though. So only about 100 will make it all the way to the fallopian tubes where the egg cell is hanging out. So um, usually fertilization takes place in the fallopian, fallopian tubes. Let me just go back for a second. The fallopian tubes were these right here, the structure. So it's the, the connection between um, the ovary and the uterus. Okay, so this is the site where fertilization, fertilization usually takes place and then that fertilized egg is going to travel down the tube and make its way to the uterus where it will embed and start to grow. So let's see here. Um, all right, fertilization, this is a fascinating process. The way that this happens is uh, the sperm is guided to where the egg is at. There are a couple of things that contribute to a sperm finding an egg. Chemotaxis is involved, and also it seems like thermotaxis is involved. So a couple of key me mechanisms that guide the sperm to the egg. Once the sperm makes contact, uh, the sperm has, on the head end, it has an acrosomal covering. This is called the acrosome. When the acrosome makes contact with the surface of the egg, which is called the zona pellucida, a couple of really key things happen. This con contact triggers release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum, 
And that calcium, once it's released, it travels, um, it travels as kind of a wave through the cell, through the egg cell. And what that does is it helps to uh, prevent fertilization by any other sperm that might be in the vicinity. So the first sperm that makes contact, that's the one that's going to successfully fertilize the egg. And that's in large part due to the role of calcium. The other thing that happens when contact is made is enzymes get released. Acrosomal enzymes get released from the head of the sperm and that helps to digest away the zona pellucida so that the sperm nucleus can make it inside of the cell. So just the nucleus goes inside, the tail gets left on the outside, and once that nucleus is in, um, then the two nuclei can, can be joined together and form a zygote. So a zygote is a fertilized egg. The, the sperm nucleus has made it into the cell, and now division is, is set to happen. So division happens very quickly early on, very rapid mitosis, and this leads to the production of a hollow ball of cells. This is called a blastocyst. And that blastocyst has a couple of key layers. The inner mass inside of the blastocyst, that will develop into the fetus, that's going to be the baby. And then the outer layer um, has other, it will develop into other things like the placenta, um, tissues that are necessary to support development of the baby. So again, once fertilization happens, this usually takes place in the fallopian tubes and then that fertilized egg will travel down. This might, take, um, this might take a day in order for it to travel down to the uterus, and then it will embed in the wall of the uterus, and, and that's where it's gonna stay put. That's where the baby will develop. So uh, development of the baby, this is something that requires really, um, really careful sort of communication between the mother's body and the baby's body. There has to be a really, um, really good delivery of materials, right, in order for this baby to develop correctly, it takes a lot of resources. So there's a very close uh, connection between the circulatory system of the mother and the circulatory system of the developing baby. The placenta is the site where this exchange of materials happens. The placenta is really key for the baby being able to grow. Um, the placenta also has a very important job in um, breaking down molecules that might harm the baby. So things that maybe are present in the mother's body, but the, the fetal body maybe isn't ready to handle. The placenta does a good job of preventing transmission of those substances. So just looking at this picture here, We've got blood, blood supply from the mother. These are the mother's arteries that lead into the placenta. And then we also have, uh, see how the, the mother's blood just kind of goes and, and bathes this fluid. We also have, coming from the baby's side, we have blood vessels. Um, you can see arteries and veins here. And the two, the two uh, cell types, the mother cells and the baby cells, really they're only separated by maybe one to two cell layers. It's a very close, close connection. Um, but that, that separation does prevent mixing of the blood of the baby and blood of the mom. So that's really important, especially if the baby has a different blood type. All right, we considered this early on, earlier on in the semester when we were thinking about blood types. Um, we don't want to have an immune reaction. We don't want the mother's body to be attacking the baby. And um, the fact that the blood is kept separate helps to prevent that. At childbirth, sometimes the blood can mix, right? There's a lot of uh, separation and, and tearing that has to go on to some extent in order for the baby to, to leave the body. So it's possible for mixing to happen then. Um, and that's why some mothers need the, the Rogam treatment in, um, very soon after birth. It has to be within 72 hours to prevent the development of antibodies in the mom. And that's only an issue if the mom has a negative blood type and the dad perhaps had a positive blood type. Um, in that case, there's, there's a risk of developing antibodies. With that, that's where we're going to end this chapter. There are certainly a lot of things that we did not cover together in this chapter, but what I'd like to just sort of leave you with the thought of is that within this baby, this baby has all of those same organ systems that we've just spent the whole semester learning about and going through. So the complexity and the, the intricacy, it's really just amazing. I think babies are fantastic, if you couldn't tell. With that, I've got to go take care of mine. I'll see you guys another time.